Well, it's another wonderful day to be gathered with the Lord's people in the Lord's house. So glad that you're here this morning. Um, As we always used to say, there's nobody here by accident. Everybody here has been called by the Lord to be here. We're thankful that you are here. We're in the magnificent, short, little New Testament letter of 1 John. It's at the end of the New Testament, just before Jude and Revelation. John, as I had said in previous weeks is one of my favorite, if not the favorite personality in the Bible other than Jesus. Um, He didn't get into trouble with Jesus like Peter did, or as not as much trouble, let's say. Uh, John stayed above the fray, the younger, quiet disciple who really listened more than he talked. I think he just uh, probably observed Jesus a lot. Um, uh, soaked it all in. John did get reprimanded once by Jesus, at least, that we have note of. John and his brother James got mad when the Samaritans wouldn't offer any hospitality to Jesus and the disciples as they were passing through Samaria. And so John and James basically said, Jesus, let us call down fire from heaven and kill them all. And Jesus didn't uh, take too kindly to that. You know, John, that's our mission field, as Brady taught us this morning in Sunday school class. We can't hate our mission field. They're the ones that we're called to reach. They're the, the ones that we're called to pray for and to minister to. But they drive us crazy sometimes, this, this unsaved mission field that we're called to. But, of course, John wrote the Gospel of John. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then John wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and he also wrote Revelation. The Gospel of John is how to be saved. 1st John is how to know that you're saved. Pretty easy to understand. The Gospel of John, uh, the stories of Jesus, it basically says you must believe on the name of Jesus to be saved. That's what the Gospel teaches us. But the letter of 1 John basically says you need to have the assurance that you are saved. So you've got to know that you know the Lord is the message of 1 John that we're studying this morning. So let's read beginning in 1 John. We're now to chapter 2. We'll go through or at least read Uh, verses 1 through 11 this morning. Not sure if we'll get through all 11 verses. I don't think we will, but we will go reading through it just to get a a feel for what the entire section says. John begins in chapter 2, my little children, I am writing you these things so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for those of the whole world. Verse 3, this is how we know that we know him, if we keep his commands. The one who says, I have come to know him, yet doesn't keep his commands is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly in him, the love of God is made complete. And this is how we know we are in him. The one who says he remains in him should walk just as Jesus walked. Dear friends, I am not writing you a new command, but an old command that you have heard from the beginning. The old command is the word that you have heard, yet I am writing you a new command which is true in him and in you because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Verse 9, the one who says he is in the light but hates his brother or sister is in darkness until now. The one who loves his brother or sister remains in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother or sister is in the darkness. He walks in the darkness, and he doesn't know where he's going. 
because the darkness has blinded his eyes. As we have said in the last few weeks in studying 1 John, the way that John writes is kind of circular. He'll write about walking in the light. And then two verses later, he writes, he says, you need to walk in the light. And then another two or three verses later, he says, so remember, walk in the light. And so it's cyclical. It just kind of goes and he comes back to the same thing. He does that with when he says, love one another. And you'll, you'll see him just repeat that over and over again, like he doesn't want you to forget it. So an interesting thing about the writings of the Apostle John that we mentioned that he wrote the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Revelation. Theologians have helped us by explaining to us how John writes. In the Gospel of John, John best explained Jesus to the reader by listing seven signs or miracles that Jesus did that proved that he was the Messiah. One of those was uh, you know, raising Lazarus. One of those was turning water into wine. It's John provides seven signs in his gospel. Um, in first John though, there are seven tests of salvation that John gives the reader. We've already covered two of those tests in chapter one. And today we'll look at the third test. So going back just a little bit, the first test of knowing that you're saved, uh, the first test of salvation is walking in the light. Walking in the light. Uh, it is putting your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ who was from the beginning. Uh, he is the eternal God, the Savior of the world. That is the first test that you would walk in him, that you are walking in him. When you question your own salvation or am I saved or is someone else saved? That's what we're going to be talking about this morning. Uh, you can say, well, is this person walking in the light or am I walking in the light? What are the, what are the proofs that I have been walking with the Lord or walking in the light? You know, John says here, if you have hate in your heart for other people, are you walking in the light? Well, not in that instance, you're walking in the darkness because of your uh, animosity, just this, just this viral hate for another person. Believing in Jesus and walking in his light is the first test of your salvation. We saw that in chapter 1, uh, verses 5 through 7. He says this, if you'll look in your scripture you can read along chapter 1, verse 5. He says, this is the message that we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light and there is absolutely no darkness in him. If we say we have fellowship with him and yet we walk in darkness, we are lying and we are not practicing the truth. If we walk in the light as he himself, Jesus is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. You know, you can know that you're walking in the light if you have someone that is, you would consider an enemy. Maybe it's someone that you've worked with for so long that now they just, you just get under each other's skin and now you really just don't care for the person at all. Um, Maybe sometimes you wish that they would just go ahead and die, uh, you know, if God would just take them. That, Lord, that would be so much easier that I wouldn't have to deal with this person. But if in your heart, when you're maybe away from them at some point, and in your quieter moments, and you think about the love of Christ in your heart and what Jesus has done for you to forgive you of your sins, and you think of that person that you've had trouble with and you then you begin to think you know I forgive them I, I forgive them I, I mean the Lord has forgiven me and just it, it is it is supernatural it is a supernatural love of Jesus in your heart that is allowing you to have love for this person that you consider your enemy that is how you know that you are saved that you are walking in the light you have light um, 
and there is no darkness in you. The second test that we saw last week was the test of confession. So the first test is walking in the light. The second test is the test of confession. And so each Sunday we'll go through another test. So um, when we get through with 1 John, you'll have nine tests that you know that these are things that I can run through my life, a grid, am I saved? So the test of confession, we are to confess our sins continually to God. We are not to make excuses for our kind of quote little sins or little white lies that we say. We are not to do that. John said in chapter 1 that we all have sinned and this ought to grieve us. We don't live in that sin. We don't live in the grief, but that guilt that a Christian feels when confronted or realizing a sin, that guilt is given to us by the Holy Spirit to really just drive us back to the Lord Jesus. That guilt is given to us mercifully so that we will not continue to, to live in this sin. I think, uh, in a way, um, pain and the pain receptors in our skin are there for a reason so that we won't put our hand, as my dad used to say, in a bear trap. Uh, you know, there are little things in life, whatever it is, it's uh, something that'll pinch you. It, it, little boys, little girls sometimes find, you know, wow, what is this? It has something that claps like that. It, you know, don't stick your finger in that. That is a bear trap it, because when it closes on your hand, it hurts. Um, so God gives us these receptors in our, in our skin so that when something causes us pain, we jerk back and we realize, don't do that. Uh, guilt it, for the Christian is the same way. It's given to us uh, by the Holy Spirit to, to say, stop, don't do that again because that is not of the Lord and in, this hurts us. We feel remorse. Sometimes you, as I said in the last few weeks, you can feel a guilt and, it, and it's not something that you can easily get away from. It's, it, it, it rides with you for a little while. It, it in a way haunts you until you can kind of work through this. And so the next time that this sin presents itself, you go, uh -huh. You like to close on my finger. You like to slam um, shut on, you know, the end of my fingers like I had hit myself with a hammer and it hurts me. And so I realized this, I'm not going to, to commit this sin as I did before. So um, we see this in chapter 1 verse 8 when Paul, uh, John wrote, he says, if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Uh, in verse 10, if we say we have not sinned, I have not sinned. We make him a liar and his word is not in us. And we, we learned last week and the week before that the, this a spe specific group of people called the Gnostics had kind of infiltrated the church, a kind of fraternity uh, believing that you had to have a special higher knowledge uh, that the only they had um, a transcendent knowledge of God to rise, raise you above what the other church people may have had. Uh, it was an aberrant teaching. It had come into the church and, and John was fighting this thing. And so this morning we come to the third test of salvation in uh, 1 John chapter 2. Uh, let's go back just a little bit to uh, the beginning of chapter 2, verse 1. He says, my little children, I'm writing you these things so that you may not sin. This is why John is writing. He doesn't want them to continue in little sins, but he doesn't want them also to soak in this false teaching of the Gnostics. Isn't it interesting too that he writes them and he says, little children, how would you feel if 
you were speaking to a, a counselor or a pastor or even your boss, and he referred to you as a little child, that when he's talking to you and he, he's trying to explain something to you, and he says, my little boy, little boy, little boy, or my, my little girl, little girl, you would, you would draw back. You would think, who are you to tell me this, that I'm a child? And yet John writes this, but he writes it in love. And he says, my little children, I'm writing to this, this to you so you won't continue in sin. I, I think when I think of John's writings, when I read them, I try to read between the lines a little bit. I don't know if you do this. How did Jesus explain this to John, this thing that John is now explaining to us? Can't you just see Jesus teaching this to the disciples for two and some odd years, them sitting around out in a field because they slept out in the open many times, and Jesus just explaining the things of God to the apostles, to the disciples. He says in verse 1, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. The advocate, the Greek here is the word paraclete. It really means helper. It says that when we as the body of Christ do sin, you have a helper. You're not out there alone. When you commit one of these, oh my goodness, how did I do this, grievous sins, John is saying you have a helper you're not out here alone just with the darts of Satan just now just pouring in on you. That you have an advocate. Well, the advocate is the Holy Spirit. And John refers to him as Jesus, the righteous one. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father interceding on your behalf and my behalf constantly. Constantly. Jesus is praying for you. You are not, not out here alone uh, if you have given your life to the Lord Jesus, Jesus is constantly praying for the good things that you need to do for the glory of God. And verse 2, he says, Jesus himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. The old King James says the word propitiation. Propitiation, you know, um, uh, I was out at the Shepherds Conference two years ago, and one of the teachers there said, um, yes, you know, we're reading out of the Christian Standard Bible this morning, I, I am, and he says, he himself is your atoning sacrifice. And I think in you know, the King James or one of maybe the ESV says propitiation, and the, the teacher said, you need a Bible that says propitiation. You just need that in there. And propitiation really means uh, the atoning work, that he himself is the atoning sacrifice, the one that made recompense, the one that paid the penalty here. Jesus has paid the penalty for our sins, and not only for ours, but he said also for those of the whole world. Now, we could go off on a Reformation tangent here on this one because we could ask the question, that Jesus paid for our sins and he also paid for the sins of the whole world? You mean that every person that is on the face of the planet has had their sins paid for? Well, if Jesus paid for the sins of the entire planet and everybody that has ever lived, then everybody is saved. But then if we say um, for the whole world, what we're meaning and what John is meaning is those that will come to Christ, those that are the elect, those that are the chosen, those are the world and those people have their sins covered. So then going to back to um, the third test of salvation, we see in verse three, we just read this, it is the obedience to God's commands. The third test of salvation is the obedience to God's commands. Verse 3, this is how we know that we know him, if we keep his commands. That's not 
hard to understand. And in, in fact, the whole message series here in 1 John, 1 John is not hard to understand. He repeats himself many times over. We're talking right here then about the word assurance. Again, assurance of salvation. A Baptist, uh, Protestants really, have talked for years and decades and millennia now, honestly, about the word assurance. Uh, we've said before that the word assurance is even a banking term. When you put your money in the bank, you know, many times the tagline at the bottom of the bank's name will have something about assurance that your money, when you put it in their bank, is going to be taken care of. It's going to be safe. You have the assurance that your money will be there tomorrow when you go to take some of it out. So we're talking about the assurance now of salvation. Have you ever had a quiet moment? Uh, I have. You think to yourself, how do I know that I'm really saved? Sometimes you think of this maybe at night or when nobody's around, maybe you're thinking through salvation. Maybe the thoughts of eternal separation from God, even the thoughts of hell come into your thinking and you think to yourself, how do I know that I'm saved? And if you think too long down that road, you begin to think about, well, what if I'm not saved? Well, how do I know? And it doesn't take very long to all of a sudden your kind of heart drops a little bit and you're like, well, I need to know. I mean, and many times though now I, I kind of catch myself and say, no, I know that I know that I'm saved because I've given my life to the Lord. And, and when the mere thought that you could be eternally separated from God kind of gives you chills, you can mentally walk through these tests that, God, that, that John gives us. And one way you, you can have assurance of salvation is that you keep God's commands. This is the third test. And, and furthermore, that you want to keep God's commands. You can know that you're saved because you want to do what the Word of God says. You want to keep the commands of the Lord. God's Word and His commands are a delight to you. Keeping His Word brings you happiness. Keeping God's Word, you find, brings you joy. When you think of doing right in the, in the eyes of the Father in heaven, you, you, you have calmness in your heart that the Lord is going to help you do the commands that he asks you to do. Uh, one of the things Baptists, and especially Reformed Baptists, believe in is that once you are saved, you are forever saved, and you cannot lose your salvation. It's um, called perseverance of the saints. Uh, Brady will teach us through that and lead us through that in the in months from now, most likely. It is uh, called one of the doctrines of grace. Uh, many people, Baptists, sometimes uh, call it once saved, always saved. To those that don't believe in that, uh, man, there are some Christian people that just really bristle at that. Um, those that are against this doctrine of grace complain that this doctrine of perseverance of the saints or always being saved that you can never lose your salvation, that this doctrine allows any Christian to do anything that they want to do with no repercussions at all. And that is not true. The answer to this complaint is to look at the fruit of the believer, to look at uh, the life of the believer. Does the professing believer walk in obedience to the commands of God? Are you doing what God says to do? Uh, it is very comforting to know that once you have given your life to the Lord, that you can know that you know that you know that you're saved, that you never have to go back monthly, weekly, um, as Baptists have always done before, you know, walk down the aisle, um, rededication. Back in the day, 
especially in youth group and things like that, you know, we'd have a youth preacher come up and then at the end they would, you know, if you've accepted the Lord as Savior or you had accepted the Lord in the past, but now something happened in your life and you need cleansing, uh, you know, in your heart and mind that you would walk down the aisle again and you would quote, rededicate your life to the Lord. And sometimes when it got like really off the rails, you know, did we ever know someone that had rededicated their life to the Lord 47 times, you know, and it, at some point it's like, why, why are you doing this? And I think it's because maybe the guilt in their heart and they wanted to be cleansed and, and we understand that, but the believer in Jesus can never lose his or her salvation. When you fully and once and for all know the Lord Jesus, accept Christ as your Savior, um, you, you know, your name was written in the Lamb's book of life before the foundation of the world. God chose you to be his son or daughter before the foundation of the world. That is what it means by being the elect. Um, Paul writes uh, so much about it, about being chosen uh, Jesus said, no one can come to me unless God first has given them to the, to the son, Jesus. Um, you can know that you know that you know that you are saved. And so that is the answer to the critics of having assurance of salvation. But here's a couple of quotes that, you know, going down this road now that we want to want to write down. Where there is root in Christ, there is fruit in the believer. That's a good one. Where there is root in Christ, there is fruit in the believer. That's the problem that those that are against the perseverance of the saints um, would say, is they would say, you can do anything, you know, these people say that they're saved, but they go off and they do everything in the world and they still claim that they are saved. Well, the truth is that if a person claims to be a Christian, they will show evidence of that. A, a tree that claims to be an orange tree will produce oranges. We, we don't have to worry. Now, there's one of two things here. If you have an orange tree and it is not producing oranges, but you know it's an orange tree, it's sick. It's a sick orange tree. And so there could be someone who is genuinely saved, but they are a spiritually sick Christian. And their brothers and sisters in Christ need to help them get back on track with their life. And that is what sanctification is. And that's what, honestly, Bible study is for. Um, you have to be in the body of Christ with your brothers and sisters in Christ so that they can help keep you accountable. You can teach each other. You can grow together. That's why church is so important. But where there is root in Christ, there is fruit in the believer. The fruit here is uh, could be and is the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, in Galatians 5.22, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Um, you'd have to write fast on that if you were going to do that. But you can find that right in your notes, Galatians 5.22. Galatians 5.22, that is where you find the fruit of the Spirit. Now, all of those things, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, all of those things that I just mentioned, we all fail at those at times. We all lose our temper uh, at times. Sometimes we're just not kind people. We need to be because we're Christians. It's, it's the fruit that grows off of the Christian tree. This is the fruit that comes off of it. Somebody that just blows their stack completely. I mean, and when I say this, you know, uh, when somebody, we talk about venting somebody's anger. And that, that word venting kind of has the word picture of a furnace that is just stoked beyond belief. It's just as hot as blazes. It's been stoked with coal and wood and fire. And when, it, when somebody raises the vent to the furnace, it, it gets oxygen into that thing and it just whoosh, it just it, it explodes with uh, with power and fire. And this is what some people's anger does. And simply the Christian is not to do that. 
We are, we are not to let our, our anger get to that point where we just, you know, vent and just blow our stack. Now, Jesus was angry. And Jesus was angry many times. In fact, the Old Testament says, be angry, but sin not. Uh, kind of a, uh, a, a counselor told me one time, you, the word of God says, it's okay to be angry about things. Jesus was angry at the Pharisees at what they were doing to the people. He was genuinely angry. But he didn't take his anger into his own hands just to, just to you know, strangle someone. So the little phrase here, it's easy to understand. Where there's root, there's the fruit. Where there's root in Christ, there's fruit in the believer. Where there's root, there's fruit. When the world sees a changed life, that is great proof of salvation. Uh, We've known of many people before that were just, just cursing maniacs. And when they became a Christian, you saw a change in them. Now, they had to learn to speak in a better tone, in a better way. But you, you saw a change. You saw that, uh, I mean, we know many people that will say that they were um, heavy drinkers, they were drug users, they were uh, any, something else like this. And when they became a Christian, many people will say, I quit cold turkey, just stopped. It just, it was over. I didn't have to um, have the drugs that I used to. Um, it's a changed life. That is the proof that we want to follow God's commands. Uh, a lot of Christian activities can be faked. But a person cannot fake being changed on the inside. You can fake a walk down an aisle and people will think that you're a Christian. You can fake a baptism and people will think that because you were baptized now you're a Christian. And you know honestly you can even fake going to seminary. And people will think that you're headed for a great ministry. There was an instance just a year or two ago um, from the seminary that I went to, New Orleans Seminary, there was an on-campus married seminary student who got into all kinds of trouble down in New Orleans and got arrested. Um, his name was plastered all over the news, and, um, and they said, and he's a student at New Orleans Seminary. But you can't fake a heart changed by Jesus. You can't fake that. A heart changed by Jesus will soon begin to exhibit the fruit of the Spirit. Not perfectly, not right away, but it will begin to happen like fruit growing on a tree and budding in the spring, but to be ripe by summertime. Uh, Pastor Steve Lawson says, faith alone saves, but faith that is alone does not save. When you say that you have faith in God, you have faith in Jesus, it is going to be accompanied by some sort of fruit at some point in the near future. Yes, our faith alone saves. Our works do not save. But because you are saved, you will do the works that Jesus did. True saving faith will always be accompanied by good works. And that gives us the assurance that a person's salvation is real. If a person says that they have come to know Christ, and yet it's the same old terrible worldly, you know, uh, secular things that this person is doing, either they have not, they're not in a community of people to hold them accountable, or they're not saved. And now in today's society and in our culture, one of the things that people in church world too, they bristle at is if you were to be a Christian and dare to tell someone else that they may not be saved. It is like, well, Mr. Christian, who do you think you are that you could tell me that I'm not saved? And we do have to walk a tightrope in that, but we do our brothers and sisters in Christ 
or maybe those that are not in Christ, a favor by not letting them get away with the charade of saying that they're uh, a believer in Christ Jesus when they do not act like it in, in one bit. In verse 4 in chapter 2, John says, The one who says, I have come to know him, and yet doesn't keep his commands, and this is just like pulls the paint right off the wall. John says, he is a liar, and the truth is not in him. John says, the person that says, I have come to know Jesus, and yet lives like hell, like, sir, you are a ball-faced liar. You're a liar, and the truth is not in you. John uses this word no about 40 or more times just in this little epistle. Um, our Greek lesson for again for this morning, this word no is the Greek word genosko. Uh, gen, geno is in there in a lot of those words. And it, it means to intimately know someone. It's the same word because I looked it up when I was studying this in Matthew uh, when Matthew, uh, when he wrote that Joseph did not intimately know or have sexual relations with Mary before Jesus was born. And so John is using this word here to describe our relationship with Jesus if we say that we love him, if we say that we know him, that that uh, verse three, this is how we are sure that we know him if we keep his commands. If we keep his commands, it, it shows others, I am in an intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus. I know the God of the universe in an intimate way. He, he is my father in heaven. I am able to call him Abba, Father, and he calls me, or you, his son. He calls you his daughter, and I know him, and I call on him. And the proof of your intimate relationship here, the proof that you know Jesus is your fruit. It's your fruit Verse 5, John said, but whoever keeps his word, truly in him the love of God is made complete. Whoever keeps his word. Now the word, this is the word of God. And honestly, there is a lot in here. There's a lot in here. But it is knowable. And much of it is repetitious. And the more that we mind the word of God the more deeper the hole is. It's just deeper and deeper and we'll never mine it all of its riches. But oh, is it so wonderful to go over. Um, when I was younger, and it's possibly because I had a, 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 you know, a touch of hyperactivity or ADD or something like that, I just couldn't hardly sit down and read or read the word. And um, to be truthful, I knew that the Lord had called me to seminary and I began to take classes for a master of divinity. Now I had been in Bible classes my whole life. I'd been in Sunday school, I'd been in church, but I was convicted at that point that my goodness, I am in seminary and I am working on a master's degree uh, in divinity and I had to admit that I had never read the Bible all the way through. And I, I, the more I thought about it, the more I thought, I can't graduate here and, and not have had read the Word of God. And so I slowly began, I started in Genesis and I started working my way through it. And I read some every single day. And do you know how you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Because the whole elephant will kill you if you try to eat it at one time. But one bite at a time and the elephant got eaten. And I was able to get through the Bible before I graduated. And honestly, now I've read through it three times. Now, that's 
to some people, not very much. Because there are some people that read through it once a year. And I'm sure somebody like David Platt, you know, he reads through it once a week or something like that. Just insane, uh, you know. But we are called to know what the Scripture says and what God's commands are. How can we keep God's commands if we don't even know what they are? So our uh, keeping the commands of Jesus proves our love for him. In John 14, 15, this is the gospel of John. John 14, 15, Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Can you see the disciples sitting around, um, uh, in, around the Sea of Galilee? They could be on a boat. They could be up at Caesarea Philippi near Dan. They could be anywhere and they're gathered together. And Jesus is saying, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. You will do the things that I do. So a word picture that Jesus gave to his disciples concerning this abiding in him was also in the gospel of John chapter 15 verses um, uh, beginning in verse 1, it's the word picture of the vine and the branches. And I'm going to close with this this morning. It's a great picture of you being attached to God and to the Lord Jesus. And Jesus taught this and he said, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. Every branch that is in me that does not produce fruit, the father, the gardener, removes and he snips off. He prunes every branch that produces fruit, that actually does produce fruit, so that it will produce more fruit. So he says in verse 4, remain in me and I in you. Just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains on the vine, neither can you unless you remain in me. Jesus is saying you cannot produce the fruit that you need to produce unless you remain in Jesus. That nutrients uh, that, that produce that bud and then ultimately that fruit, it runs up the, up the trunk and out into the branch and into the fruit. And that's what produces it. And it ultimately, he's saying, comes from Jesus. Jesus says in verse 5, I am the vine and you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit. Because you can do nothing without me. That, that is that's powerful. That tells you, you can do nothing without Jesus. He says in verse six, if anyone does not remain in me, and this is the negative aspect of it, he says, he, that branch, he is thrown aside like a branch and he withers and they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, Ask whatever you want and it will be done for you. He is saying basically not that we would ask for crazy, you know, whatever things in the world. He's talking about ask what you need of the Father so that you will produce much fruit. This is what we're talking about. Ask what you need so that you will produce much fruit and the Father will give it to you. It will be done for you. And he says in verse 8, my father is glorified in this, that you produce much fruit and prove to be my disciples. God in heaven is glorified when you and I produce much fruit. And then verse 5 of going back to 1 John, this is how we know that we are in him. The one who says he remains in him should walk just as he walked. Well, we're sinful human beings. How can we walk just as Jesus walked? He was perfect. He was God and we are not. 
But this is something that we always strive for. And my grandmother Ruby would tell us in our prayers, we would repeat after her and she would say, Lord, help me to be more like Jesus. Lord, help me to be more like Jesus. And of course, believers obedience will not be perfect as we are still sinners. But Jesus established this pattern that we are to seek to follow. If a person claims to know Jesus and abide in Jesus, it will be clearly evident through that person's fruit. A believer will walk in the light. You'll, you'll walk in the truth. We will walk in holiness. A true believer will guard what has been entrusted to them. And what has been entrusted to you, it is the truth of God's word and his commandments in his word. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come to you. We thank you for this teaching. We thank you of all of the hours that Jesus spent with his disciples. And we thank you for the hours that John spent with his church and disciples in Ephesus as he wrote this. Father, help us to remain in you, to remain in Jesus, to not stray out, to not do the things that we want to do on our own but that we do nothing except what the Lord Jesus has called us to do in our lives and commanded us to do. Forgive us for our sins, Lord. Help us to be more like Jesus. And we pray this in Christ's name and all God's people said, amen.